And like I said, a lot around farming and gardening. Even our hunting season revolved around the garden. We would do our hunting mostly this time of year in the winter. The winter season is when the parasites and the sicknesses are in less, less in the animals. And so that would be the time that hunting was done. Okay, I want to share with you some weapons to uh, kind of conclude my, my show today for you. The ancient weapons I'm going to start with go back to paleo people. Paleo people means way, way, way back. I see stuff. So, but these, these weapons actually survived into the historical times the way I am dressed right now. As a matter of fact, this is a copy of a Calusa War Club that would have been used against Ponce de Leon on his second trip when the Calusa found out the bad things he'd done to the tribes in Cuba. They wasted no time attacking his ships. And as his men barely got off, he was shot in the thigh with a poisoned arrow that he died from back in Cuba. I guess that's what you get for changing the name of our land. Huh. Yeah. Those are shark's teeth, and that's pre sap blue holding them in there. This is a copy of an original. Here's another copy of an original. I like to call it the noggin knocker. War clubs like this go all the way back to cave people. They were the first weapons. And natives even carried them in their belts. Once we started getting guns, we still carried the old war clubs around. Why? Guns only shoot once. War clubs can be used over and over and over, as long as you've got the ability of swinging. And so we love the old war club. We call it the finisher. Yeah. So we were carrying the war clubs in our belts up into the 1800s. Even, even up into the Seminole War Wars. The next weapon you're going to see is the first spear. Another stick, and just a sharp stick at that. Heating it in the fire, sharpening it by scraping it on rocks. And as time went on, people learned to add things to their sticks and make them better. Whenever you would stab this into an animal, this would stick in and this would come off. That's how a lot of them were made. And so, as time went on, people learned to throw spears. And as they stopped making them big and heavy, they started making them a lot smaller and lighter for travel and flight. And so this became more of what it would be like for throwing. Now this one, if I throw with my hand, it would only get to the Spanish flag over there, and that's about it. Watch. <laughs> You should have seen the look on that lady's face right there. <laughs> if I want this arrow to go all the way across the street into the yard of the fort, then I've got to make my arm a little bit longer, don't I? Everybody say, addle, addle. Addle, addle. The addle, addle is a throwing stick used by people all over the world, not just Native Americans. And so all over the world people had this. And when one person saw it, another person went, hmm, why didn't I think of that? And they did it too. And so whenever this spear gets thrown using the addle addle, my arm just got that long. And yes, it could go across the street onto the yard of the fort. That would hit the woolly mammoth and sink in. And that would fall off onto the ground. And the woolly mammoth would take off with this stuck in him, bleeding, tracks left behind, we're going to follow. We're going to pick up this and add a new one of these. And so we didn't need to carry a bunch of arrows back then. This goes back to the archaic time. Everybody say it with me again, addle, addle. As time went on, people made this stick even better. They took that stick and they began carving on it, making it thin. And as it became thin, it could bend. And that whole idea is eventually going to lead this next weapon, the bow. And by the end of the Ice Age, all over the world, the bow starts to become the new weapon. The arrows aren't going to stay like this. The bow can shoot an arrow a lot farther than I can throw it. And so we're going to need to make that, that um, arrow a lot smaller. I have a case I made out of the skin of a garfish. And it keeps these arrows in here well protected. There you go. They're made of river cane, which is what 
natives here would have used the cane from the river, not bamboo. Bamboo is not native to Florida, just like citrus is not native to Florida. Both of those were brought here by the Spanish. And so river cane was native. Some of our arrows were very sharp. Some of them were made of flint. Some of them were made of bone. This is a scale I'm pointing at of a garfish right there. Here's one made of a great white shark tooth. And don't you know they used those on the beach when they found them? And so they used a little bit of this or that. Some were sharp wood. Some were splintered river cane. When the Spanish wore the chain meal, the natives took the arrowhead off, used poison sometimes, but the, the, the river cane would hit that chain meal and splinter <coughs> and go right in. And so that was a way of getting around that. We had a way to get around lots of things. You should have seen where I was at last night. <laughs> All right. And so this is the weapon we're going to be using upon the arrival of the gun. Now, the first guns are not what you're seeing here today. They're called arquebus, and they were out of period by the colonial days. They're a burning match or burning wick on a stick, on, on a, a trigger that goes into the powder and lights it. And so that's the old weapons of the days of Columbus and, and Ponce de Leon and Pedro Menendez. But by the colonial times here, the old tribes of Florida are gone. The survivors that don't die away from disease, war, and slavery are blending here into St. Augustine. And when the Spanish turned Florida over to the British at, during the Revolutionary War time, a lot of these tribes join the Spanish and leave with them and go to the islands. And today, we're finding descendants of these people in the islands of Cuba and other islands today. And so some of them survived there. Some of them blended with other Native American tribes. As tribes came down out of Georgia, as slaves joined in, the word Cimarron from the Spanish became Seminole. And they became a new tribe. They were a blending. And yes, there was a lot of languages in their group being spoken, not just one. There was Uchis, there was Yamases, there was Muscogees, there were um, Alabamus. There was lots of different groups that became the Seminoles. And so, lots of languages. And by the era that they came down in, the mid-1700s, early 1700s, trade, not with each other anymore, now with Europeans, was big. When we saw metal tools, who wants to use a shell now? Who wants a rock now? I want a metal knife. When we saw a metal axe, and we don't have to burn the wood first, we wanted a metal axe. We would be offering the Army services like you see us here today as the guides for the military. So when they go out into the field, we know the trail. We make sure they get where they need to go. We are the eyes and the ears for them in the woods. And so we controlled a lot of the scouting missions that needed done. And we would be gifted things for doing so. Often we would carry them back to our villages and show them off. Look at this nice cloth they gave me. Everybody would want one. And so pretty soon they would establish trading posts. The, even when the Spanish came back to Florida in the second period, the, the natives required the British trading posts to stay along the St. John's River because they liked the superiority of the British trade goods compared to what the Spanish had. And so the British trading company stayed and the trade kept going. And by the time the United States took over Florida in 1821 from the Spanish, the native people were well established as Seminoles, and they were using guns and using metal cooking pots and wearing the European clothing, what the white man had called the civilized.